Psalm 119. And for those who don't know, Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, as I said, it's an acrostic, which means each section is divided up by a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's funny because uh, Psalm 117, just right next to it, is like the shortest psalm. Right after that's the longest psalm. So we're going to do a group reading. I want you to, we're going to read slowly, smoothly, and uh, I want you to focus on these words, okay? Because this is a prayer, and of course, Psalm 118 is all about the law of the Lord, the Torah, the covenant that God made with his people. That's what David is talking about here. And I want us just to read this as a congregation, as a prayer for how we want to receive the message today. This is such a great prayer. We're going to pray it out as the body of Christ to the Lord and ask him to do this for us in our lives this morning. And uh, I would definitely suggest referring back to it from time to time, especially when when you want to hear from the Lord. So is everybody ready? Psalm 119, and we're going to begin reading in verse 25 and go down to verse 32. Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. I told you my plans and you answered. Now teach me your decrees. Help me understand the meaning of your commandments and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. I have chosen to be faithful. I have determined to live by your regulations. I cling to your laws. Lord, don't let me be put to shame. I will pursue your commands, for you expand my understanding. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it amazing how this psalm written so many millennia ago is still so relevant for us today? Beautiful psalm. Mark that one in your Bibles. Uh, Psalm 119, 25 through 32. It says, keep me from lying to myself. That's the idea of self-deception. And expand my understanding. That's really what we want here this morning. So we're going through Ephesians, uh, book of Ephesians, and we come across the, the spiritual gifts in Ephesians 4, and I really thought, you know, it's going to be a long time before we hit this idea of spiritual gifts, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time here on it this morning. So, um, by way of doing that, if you could turn over now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So, as we said before, there are four places in the New Testament that gifts are mentioned. Psalm, sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. And so we're going to, again, I thought we'd just go through some of those passages and look at the lists there. And so we'll look at 1 Corinthians 12, uh, beginning in verse 7. But we realize that Paul repeats that same list a few verses later in verse 28. But 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is the longest section on spiritual gifts by far that we have in our New Testaments. Now, I want to re, uh, remind you of what was said last week briefly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 falls right in the middle of this section, right? And 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the the love chapter, well-known chapter, maybe one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, read at most every wedding. And so it should be, I'm sure it was read at mine. But we have to realize the original intention, the original context for that love section is in the context, the broader context of using our spiritual gifts, isn't it? So the way it describes love is how we're supposed to love in the context of a local church, serving each other, building each other up. And we said that a church that is functioning that way is a beautiful place to be. It's a place you want to be, isn't it? Because not only do you encourage and serve others, but you're encouraged and you're served. And in that way, we reflect the body of Christ. In that way, we manifest the presence of Jesus in our community. And that's a beautiful thing. And we said also that each one of us has been given a special gift each one of us. So it's all important that we do our part in, in loving one another, by serving one another, by through the way that God has primarily gifted us to serve. And when we're doing that, that's a healthy, vital church. So let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 7. 
a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can so we can help each other to one person the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice to another the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge the same spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else the one spirit gives the gift of healing he gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy he gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another person is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, in the collective expression use of all these gifts, you know what we have? You know what the result is? The end result is you become a part of something that is bigger than yourself. And that is a desire that each of us has deep within our nature. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God. So this is exactly the practical expression of how you become part of something bigger than yourself. And it is isn't amazing that God provided the local church for us so that we all have access to something like this all within reach. So it's, again, you get to be a part. It's not a spectator sport, is it? I'm getting ahead of myself, but here's the right. If you just sit in a a sermon, sit in a worship service, and you're just observing, and you're just taking in, here's what I liken it to. You are satiated, with reference to the idea of food and eating, you're satiated or satisfied, but you're not nourished. Do you see the difference? You can take in calories... And uh, the calories can either be, give you the feeling of being full, but they're not nourishing you as far as building up the body, strengthening the body, giving you energy to go out and perform action. So the, the idea here is you want to hear and receive, and you want to be ministered to for the purpose of going out and ministering to others. The local church, when we gather, it's a great time to be encouraged, to be fed, to be strengthened, to be equipped. It's not the only place to be equipped, but it's one of the places to be equipped so you can get those nutrients, not just for the feeling of satisfaction, but for the feeling of being nourished so you can go out so the body can be strengthened, it can be edified, it can be built up, or actually make it a difference in the world. All right, so I thought we would run through just a few of these. Um, there are some of the more challenging gifts mentioned in this, this section. And uh, Lord willing, in a not next Sunday, it's Good Friday, but not the Sunday after that, that's Easter, but in the, uh, Sundays ahead, well, I, I kind of want to go through a list comprehensively some, in some way um, to, to give you all an idea about how these gifts can be played out in our context. And I realize some of us, I don't want to assume that we all understand spiritual gifts, we all understand what they mean and how they can be utilized and uh, functioning in our local church. So we just want to take a time to say, hey, this may be a time of discovery for you, that the Holy Spirit would kind of bring something to mind to say, hey, I I could try this, or hey, that might be a gift I never even recognized or or knew about. Oftentimes, you have more than one gift. And if you're a, a son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you're not using your, your spiritual gift or gifts in a, in a intentional a committed, faithful way, I want to say that you're missing out. You're missing out. And it's, it's, it's again, part of being used um, by the Holy Spirit, that, that's a beautiful thing. And it means uh, that you get to be a part of, as I said, something bigger than yourselves. So here's the difficulty with reference to uh, spiritual gifts in the New Testament. Hear this. Here's the difficult thing. We're trying to discern and discover what these gifts are, Paul's point in listing the gifts is simply to show that there are a variety of gifts. That's his only point, really. To show, hey, there's a variety of gifts. But he does not explain or comment at any length on the gifts, except those that were causing problems. (laughs) So it's not like you're going to find anywhere in the New Testament a a detailed uh, definition of the spiritual gifts. Now, is, is inspired scripture capable of giving us detail? 
Oh, it is. Have you, have you read the passages in the Old Testament where it talked about the, the detail that Yahweh, that God gave to the Israelites in crafting the tabernacle? I mean, exquisite detail. He's like, I, I, he's very specific with reference to the tabernacle, how it should be built with the measurements, with the materials, and everything. How it should be put up, how it should be taken down, all this detail. When it comes to spiritual gifts, we don't get that. And you have to say, well, it's not an oversight. There's, there's intentionality there. And we'll talk about what that is towards the end, because I want to run through a few of these gifts, and then we'll get to some of the more practical matters that will help us in the exercise of those gifts. So the first one, as the NLT records it, is in verse 8, to, to the uh, one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Now, the Greek lexicon, what's known as the BDAG, defines wisdom as the ability to understand and function accordingly. The ability to understand and function accordingly. So you understand some things, and that understanding affects how you navigate through the world. By the way, in most instances in your Bible, wisdom precedes knowledge. Wisdom leads to knowledge. And you would think it would be the other way around. But Paul has to already, when, when we're seeking to define these gifts, one of the things we need to do is, is look at, hey, where has Paul already talked about this? Or where has the inspired writer already mentioned this, this word? Or where else in the Bible do we find this concept? Our first go-to place to define things in Scripture is Scripture itself, isn't it? It's not like we read something and then we look out in the world and look for it and define it that way. Because we'll get confused. Now, so Paul has already uh, defined wisdom in chapters 1 through 4 of the same book, 1 Corinthians, as primarily the self-sacrifice for the well-being of others that Jesus modeled and that is counterintuitive and opposite to the wisdom of the world. So the idea, especially in the Greek world, that you would sacrifice for the good of others was foolishness. But Paul calls that the wisdom of God. So if we take that definition from chapters 1 through 4, and now we bring it to the spiritual gift, people that are able to give wise advice are able to make good choices when, false, when faced with multiple paths. They're able to make good choices. Others seek them out when faced with difficult choices. And they live good lives filled with humility, self-control, and dependence upon God. They can help bring peace to situations through their insight. They're able to objectively differentiate between competing pathways or points of view. You say, well, where did you get the definition? What we see is when people begin to operate in a community, in a gospel community, in a church, at that point we can observe what it it's becomes immediately apparent because gifts emerge in community. We begin to observe people that have this gift, and then a pattern emerges over time. And through that pattern, then we can extract a definition. Now, this, having people with the gift of wisdom in your church, do we think that's important? Isn't that a blessing? Too, and this is a proof that we don't have to do life alone. And isn't it wisdom that says there is safety in a multitude of counselors? Isn't it awesome that you have access to a gospel community where you can actually reach out to other people that have more experience, that have the gift of wisdom, that they can guide you through? how to make the, the best possible choice when it comes to those major crossroads in life? Isn't that a blessing? What happens if all the people in the church who have the gift of wisdom just like, ah, I don't have time for that? Can you imagine how devastated a church assembly would be without wisdom? Oftentimes, we, we feel like, hey, I don't want to consult the person who has this gift of wisdom, who everybody knows is, is a wise person, because they're going to tell me what I don't want to hear. Am I right? Sometimes that's why we resist. But can I tell you this? Just because you don't hear their counsel doesn't mean those consequences aren't going to happen. It doesn't change the situation. Like, hey, if I don't hear their wise counsel, I can keep doing what I'm going to do and it'll be fine. Now, if I, if I get that counsel, then all those consequences that they bring up, those are going to come into existence. No, in fact, you know what? Wisdom says, hey, I want to know on the front end Amen. and adjust accordingly. So there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Each of us need to have people in our life that are go-to people. We have a, a already an established relationship that when those big decisions come in life, we go to them. 
Now, do you think someone who has the gift of wisdom is going to want to exercise that gift of wisdom? They would be wise to. Do you think um, someone who has the gift of wisdom is merely going to want to exercise that gift of wisdom so they can lord it over you and make you feel bad? So like, ha, see, you're so needy. You needed my help. I'm so wise. I helped you out. Is that someone who has the spiritual gift of wisdom? Is that how they're going to make you feel? Or are they going to be encouraged that they had an opportunity to help build up the church to help build you up? They're not not there to to rub your face and your problem, your issue. We all have them. They're there, and they're encouraged when they see you prosper as a result of them getting to be used by the Holy Spirit to build you up. So don't feel like you're in their pocket, as it were, right? They're there. It's a blessing for people who have this gift to be able to use this gift. So the, the, the ability to give wise advice. The, the next one listed in this list in 1 Corinthians 12 is special knowledge. Now, the lexicon defines knowledge as the intellectual grasp of something. The intellectual grasp of something. A message marked by theological understanding including an understanding based on the study of Scripture. The knowledge reflected in the apostles and prophets was a God-given knowledge that flowed from a spirit-guided, saturating of the heart and mind in the Scriptures. Do the inspired writers who wrote the Bible, the New Testament, ever refer back to other Scriptures? A lot, especially the book of Revelation. A lot. That's why we say it's a finely woven tapestry, the Bible is. So if we, we extract from that, the, getting knowledge is not just spontaneous knowledge right now. New situation. It's also for coming from a person who's been saturated in the very word of God. Okay? And they, they have the ability to have a theological understanding. They understand some things. <clears throat> they see things with a, a, a God-centered worldview. Because they have a knowledge about how things are, uh, are working. Now, in going through these lists, as we go through these lists over the weeks ahead, I, I want to, um, some of them are controversial, are they not? And there are, can be uh, uh, times when good men disagree. This is the expression that was often used in seminary. Well, good men disagree, but we take this position. So that is to say that there are, are good, uh, oftentimes in Scripture, there are times when there are mutually um, be- good interpretations. Some conservatives hold this and some hold this. So what, what do we do when we, we um, what do we think about when we come to situations like that? We're trying to understand the Scripture. What do we do? One of the things we do is we say, um, well, what can, it, there may be some debatable things here, but what can everybody agree on? So there may be debate about, we look at it, we say, okay, yes, good men disagree on this, but both sides agree that it is actually teaching this. And when we do that, what we end up with is, um, we're seeking to get the answers. We're actually, let me put it this way. We're not asking questions of the text that the text is not trying to answer. You see? Oftentimes we go and say, I want to I know, what does the Bible say about this? And then uh, on this particular topic, and on that topic, good men disagree. And oftentimes the Bible's not trying to be clear on that. And we're asking questions of the text it's not trying to answer. And that leads us as a church to have close-handed issues and open-handed issues. The close-handed issues are all those things the Bible is very clear on. The open-handed issues are we're asking questions the Bible's not trying to answer spe- specifically. And we allow there to be some leeway there. You may hold a different position than me, but we're both still orthodox. Okay? That is to say, we're both believing the, the right, um, believing the gospel, to put it bluntly. So what I want to do in these lists is, I want to talk about what we, can, uh, what we can be sure of. What we can be certain of. And when the Bible's unclear, I'm, I'm allowing that ambiguity to remain there. That is to say, if it's not clear, we don't need to make it more clear than it is by forcing our interpretation on it, okay? Because we want to be honest with the text. Now, Acts chapter 5, 1 through 4, may be an instance of the exercise of special knowledge. It may be, but we're not told for sure. 
So again, we're starting to say, well, where in the Bible can we find an instance? And what do we find happening in Acts chapter 5? 1 through 6. 1 through 4, rather. But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming that it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you left? let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Of course, it says, as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. How did Peter know this? It's possible that he was given special knowledge. And you can see how, because the Holy Spirit was making a statement. We're going to take the truth very seriously in the church. This text is setting a precedent for the rest of the New Testament era. So like, hey, we're not here just to, it's all okay, it's, um, we can you know, lie to each other. No, community is very important. That's one uh, truth that we can extract from that. But the point is, this could be an instance of Peter being given special knowledge, but we're not sure. Now, lest you doubt, if you're very conservative in your background, and you doubt that um, special knowledge can be around today, an, an illustration that I like to give is Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon is one of the most famous um, uh, preachers of the 19th century over in London. Very well known. Um, thousands would gather to hear him preach. He's, he's loved by um, Christians, conservative, and even liberal. So he's well, he's well accepted um, preacher from the past. And there's a story recorded. Charles Spurgeon, one time while he was pre preaching, pointed to the gallery and said, Young man, the gloves in your pocket are not paid for. <laughs> Can you imagine? Thousands of people gathered. He points up to one of the galleries and makes that statement. Now, why would he do that? Now, no one's going to question the veracity of Charles Spurgeon. Very conservative, very orthodox, uh, a genius by, by, by the world's standards. Uh, what, what do we extract from that is, and sure enough, it, came to, came to, uh, it was immediately became apparent that that man did have a stolen pair of gloves in his pocket. While he fe felt the, the uh, need to stop the message and make that statement, well, he was given a special word of knowledge. And I could give you other conservative examples of people. So it's not just like, oh, the, the people on the periphery, all the, the kind of crazy Christians who believe in all the extra crazy stuff, it, it's only for them, and they are the only ones that believe it. We can give plenty of special examples as well. Now, I'm going to give us some, some, uh, some boundaries for that in a moment, okay? And it, that they're going to be really helpful because it, with, with the exercise of these gifts, we can make two errors. We can say, nope, none of them exist anymore. All these, all these extra special crazy ones, they don't exist anymore. And we cut ourselves off from, we, and if, if they are still existing, that means we're saying, uh-uh, Holy Spirit, uh-uh. Nope. So that, that, you got to be careful there. The other thing we can do is we can just take everything uncritically as from the Holy Spirit and be easily deceived. You see? So there's an, there's an equal and opposite error on either side of the road. And we don't want to fall into either ditch because we want to be biblical. So when I, when, after we mention a few more gifts, I'll, I'll, I'll give us some boundaries how to do that. So um, <clears throat> this does not mean that special knowledge has the same status of revelation in scripture or that it should not be tested so if Spurgeon says that I want to find out did that guy have any gloves in his pocket oh yeah he did he did steal them okay so there's a way to verify okay that's <laughs> leaders in the charismatic circles charismatic what does that mean Charis it comes from the Greek word charismata which means gift Charismatics, um, that is kind of like a modern-day expression of the Pentecostal movement. started back in the 1970s. It's the latest iteration of, let's say, ministries that are marked and characterized by a strong emphasis on the exercise of the spiritual gifts. Okay? Pentecostal movement is a much older movement. and goes back about 100 years. So leaders in charismatic circles are well aware that people may speak prophecies or tongues 
getting ahead of myself here, in the flesh. That is, leaders know that some are psychologically motivated. Some. And this is charismatic leaders uh, confessing this. They, they're aware of this. But we should neither reject the idea of this gift of special knowledge or receive it, as I said, uncritically. So some preachers say, for instance, that they have a special word of knowledge and they some, say something like, someone here is caught in adultery. You guys ever hear? Have you been exposed to something like this, seen something like this? Some of you are shaking your heads. Yes. So you know what's interesting about that, an instance like that? Here is a mix of so-called special knowledge along with, right along with, ignorance. Because someone here, right? So I know something specifically, but, but there's another part I have no idea about. And what can that lead to? Suspicion, doubt. Does that seem like it's going to build up the church? Now, also, keep in mind that these letters were written to churches that were often meeting in houses, smaller churches gathered in homes. And it's likely that people in those churches knew each other's business. So when we're thinking about what the definition of these gifts are, we need to think about what was it like for the original audience of these letters. What was it like for them? So again, um, so we neither need to be like, completely resisting the idea of someone receiving special knowledge, nor receive it uncritically, okay? I'll say more about that in, um, later. And also, I want to say something that's re uh, relevant to the idea of how, would, how do we receive? What does it even look like to receive a word of special knowledge? What does it look like to receive prophecy? How does that even happen? And I want, I want to make a suggestion as to how that happens so that we can be more sensitive as a church to receiving the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So I hope I get there. If we don't do that, get that. It's towards the end. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in, in the weeks ahead. Um, the next one listed is great faith. And this is to say a faith in an almighty and sovereign God who is capable of intervening in the most dramatic and supernatural ways. And allows one to have a strong belief that God can overcome any problem and can be trusted to act on our behalf. An example of leading through faith is believing that God can change lives. Acting on that belief and then inspiring others with that. Isn't that the kind of person you want around you? Someone that has great faith? You ever been kind of discouraged and then you get around a person who has great faith and they start speaking God's promises to you? And you feel some kind of rebuked like, wow, why am I not living this this way. You feel rebuked, but you also feel encouraged. Amen. Because they have this, this ability to demonstrate the certainty that God will come through. And you leave that person just built up and encouraged, like, yes! And your strength is faith, and, you, and your faith is, is enlarged, and, and the doubting kind of dissipates. It, uh, the characteristics of those with this gift, they have unshakable, an unshakable trust in God's power and love, which they can help others to see. They're not dismayed when situations look bleak, believing that all things work together towards the good for those who love the Lord. They believe that things happen for a reason and that God is active in the world. And they're bold in their prayer life, asking God for things which only He could make possible. They see no challenge is insurmountable, and they set very high spiritual, financial, and relational goals. You know who uh, exercises this gift around me personally? is uh, Drew Madre. He says things that take great faith to say sometimes, and I leave him, uh, his presence just being encouraged. He talks about just, just so, with such certainty, what God's going to do here in the future. And I leave him like, yes, and it motivates me to work harder, to, to, with all my might, great faith. So for those with um, great faith, it's in whatever church setting you find yourself in, whether it be a, a community group, uh, a family meeting, uh, a Bible study, a sermon, a personal conversation, you want to encourage people to trust in God to overcome all odds. That's what a person with this gift does. And don't we need that in the local church? Are we going to hit hard times? Some of you have hit some very hard times even this last week and the weeks previous. You need someone to be around someone with a gift of great faith to recalibrate your thinking so you don't stay in, in the mode of being discouraged. Next, we come to the gift of healing. 
Is God able to still heal today? So uh, I believe God is still able to heal today. Definitely believe that. But here is, um, let, let's take what we can learn from the text, okay? Actually, if the gift of healing is mentioned twice. It's mentioned here in verse 9 and then further down in the chapter in verse 28. And if you look at the original wording there, it's actually not the gift of healing. It's the gifts of healing. Charismata, that's a, a plural form of that word. It's the gifts of healing. And did, did Paul exercise the gift of healing? Yes, he did. What's, and if we look at the life of Paul with reference to healing, we, we find something kind of interesting, which corresponds to and kind of shows us and highlights why he would say it the way he says it. He says, gifts of healing. That is to say, he's referring to specific instances where healing took place. Paul does not refer to the power to heal all diseases, but to, but to instances of actual healing. And that's why I believe that Paul is careful in his language here. So I'll give you a few examples. There's three examples that I found in the book of Acts alone where Paul is involved in healing. Okay, And I'll read two of those to you briefly, and we'll see what we can learn. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 10 would be the first example. Acts 14, 8 through 10. And I'll read that for you. While they were in, at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. you see that? Paul realized, looking at him, he realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and, and started walking. I'll make a comment on that, but I want to read the next one first. The next one um, would be in uh, Acts chapter 19, 11 and 12. But we'll skip that one for sake of time and go to the third one, which is Acts 28, 8 and 9. Acts 28, 8 and 9, the last chapter in the book of Acts. So it, in some sense, this Acts 28 passage, we realize it's very end to, it's close to the end of Paul's ministry, okay? Acts chapter 28, 8 and 9 says, As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in, and what did he do? Prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. He healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. You heal one, you got to heal them all, right? It seems like. Word gets out. So in the first instance, Paul realized that the man had great faith. He had faith to be healed, and he simply calls out, stand up. As if to say, you already have the faith, believe. The second instance, we find that Paul is, lay, is praying. He's, he's healing through the mode of prayer and laying his hands on, on, on this person. Now, which is, lines up with what we find in James chapter 5, where it talks about healing, talks about calling for the elders, anointing with oil. The primary mode we find healing coming through is prayer in the New Testament. And oftentimes in, in the old. So oftentimes healing takes through, happens or takes place through prayer. Praying specifically for something. But, he, but if we were to look at, we could stop there, but we need to look at more evidence. Do you recall 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7? 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul, Paul records this. So to keep me from becoming proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. It says it again. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. That is to say, I, I prayed to the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need, my power works best in weakness. Paul prayed for healing in his own life. Did he get it? So did he get healing in every instance? Here's an instance where he didn't get healing. We also read um, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. 2 Timothy 4.20, um, I'll just read this briefly. Erastus, 
stayed at Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. Paul left Trophimus in what condition? Sick. If, he was, if Paul was able to heal in every instance, why do we have instances here where people are left sick? So yes, sometimes people were completely and miraculously healed. And other times, God, for his good purposes, decided not to. Okay? So that's why I believe that we, when we read in 1 Corinthians 12, he says gifts of healing. He's referring to specific instances, realizing it's not a, hey, I'm, I healed one person one time. God used me to help heal a person one time. I can now start my own healing ministry and get a website. And everybody will come to me and I will clear out all the hospitals. Okay? So we want to be careful there. We want, we want to continue to exercise faith. Another example for that, if you're interested to look it up, it would be Philippians chapter 2, verse 27. Philippians 2, 27. So just to summarize there, healing can happen today, but it's, it's through the exercise of faith, and ultimately we, we trust in God's sovereignty. And can I also say sometimes when people, um, we pray for their healing, and yet the, they go on to be with the Lord, can I tell you, me personally, I consider that great healing? Amen. Because when Paul went to be with, with the Lord, he was caught up into the third heaven, he did not want to come back. Remember he mentions this? He says to be absent from the body, he's talking about being absent from the body, and to be with the Lord is, is far better. But nevertheless, because essentially because I'm, God still has a mission for me, I'm coming back for you. But hey, I'd much rather be there, right? He's tasted and seen in an amazing way that the Lord is good. So I consider when, when we pray for people, it's oftentimes because we're, we're, we're narrow in our request that we don't step back and realize God did actually answer that prayer in the affirmative without it, in, a, in a far greater way or different than way than what we are expecting. So God, is, in his sovereignty, is not limited by our perspective. Thank goodness is right. Now I'm going to skip over perform miracles just uh, for sake of time. Man, it's flying by. We'll come back to that one in the weeks ahead, because I want to kind of pick up the pace here. Um, the next one we come to is prophecy. Prophecy. Now, what, how do you define prophecy? I'll just ask you that really quickly. How do you define it? And oftentimes, the emphasis when we hear the word prophecy is what? Telling future events. Is that right? Is that what we often think of? Prophecy because we look at the Old Testament prophets, and oftentimes they are telling future events, aren't they? But that is not really the essence of prophecy. That happens as a result of what the, the, the prophet is seeking to accomplish. So let me define a prophecy, prophecy for you in this way. Prophecy is speaking God's truth to specific situations, contexts, or occasions. It is the communication of a divine message. Here's the specifics. It's the communication of a divine message to a, to a tailored to the special needs and issues of, of those gathered to hear it. Hey, it's, so basically it's, hey, prophecy is what God has to say about this situation. It is not so much foretelling as it is forth-telling. Prophets call people back to God. Prophets speak a particular message that a church needs to hear at any given moment while teachers pass on the same Christian teachings that need to be uh, learned by all believers. There's the difference between a prophet and a teacher. So the idea of a prophet is he sees things in black and white. He says, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. And he's bold. And oftentimes, what do we find in, in Scripture? The prophet is marginalized. He's not accepted because no one wants to hear it. No one wants to hear it. Now, can you see how we, why we need people who are prophetic in a local church? Because oftentimes, we can all be swept away by something, and we need someone that's going to come in and say, set us straight. Say, actually, that's not what Scripture teaches. Actually, what the Lord teaches, what the Lord has said is this. So what the prophet is proclaiming is not necessarily coming to their mind right in that instance um, in and of itself. What we find from the prophets and scripture is they are deeply saturated in the word of God. Saturated in the word of God. 
Now, it's, but they speak God's word to a specific situation. Because oftentimes, you know, a new situation arises, and we're, we're caught up in it emotionally, and we're like, what do we do? What do we do? Right? And you're like, I don't know. At those times, it's helpful to have someone who sees things in black and white, right? Who can just see clearly, hey, I know this seems all completely chaotic right now, but actually, this is how the Bible, this is what Scripture says. This is what the Lord says about this situation. And you're like, oh, of course. Whew. That's what that is. We need prophets in our church, in our congregation, in our assembly. We'll say more about prophets because with the gifts, we see that there, it's a two-edged sword, double-edged sword. There's, there's a benefit, but usually with our gifts, there's also a negative. Can you think about what the negative would be for someone who's very prophetic? Is it hard to be around someone who always sees things in black and white? Sometimes a prophet can lack this little thing called empathy because they see it so clearly, like, of co- this is what the Lord says. What's, what's the matter with you? You're like, right? And they can, they can be a little abrasive. Amen. Can you see why we need prophets to be in a church with encouragers? So the, so the prophet doesn't just split the church because everybody goes home discouraged, right? We need those hard words, but we also need to be encouraged, too. So that's just one example. Balance. Now, balance. Now, Man, I'm running out of time, and I want to get to the practical things, so bear with me, please. We're, we're, we're actually almost done. Do you notice that when it comes to prophecy in tongues, both of them require interpretation? So the next gift listed after prophecy is the ability to discern these prophecies, the ability to discern these messages. So should we accept wholesale everything that someone gets up and says, hey, um, God told me, Oh, they're a prophet, so they must be right. They've been right in the past, so they must be right now. Can you see how that would be, uh, lead to being able to easily deceive people? You tell people truth, you tell them truth, you tell them truth, you tell them truth, you tell them truth. You get them in the habit of hearing truth from you, and then you tell them God told me that you've got to give me a Bentley. Do you see how that would work? And like, well, he's been right about everything else. Better give him that Bentley. That's what the Lord has said, Right? Uh, well, I've matured, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I don't see any of the other pastors driving Lamborghinis, so, no, just kidding. Um, now, oftentimes, when it comes to these gifts that are more what we call spectacular, here's the verse I find myself going to again and again to maintain balance. I find this next verse I'm going to give so helpful Um, To not be resisting the Holy Spirit, but also not to accept everything uncritically. And this is exactly what Paul himself says to do. So we need to discern messages. And the the verse I go to um, is 1 Thessalonians 5. Go to the very end of the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, and verse 19 through 22. This, to me, shows the balance that we uh, aim to maintain at our church. Right here, ready? Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. That is to say, don't try to shut the Holy Spirit up because the Holy Spirit doesn't fit within your theological paradigm. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies. Don't scoff at prophecies. But test everything that is said. But test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. See, if we don't test these things and we accept everything uncritically that someone who calls himself a prophet says, Paul's saying it, leads, it can lead to evil. And don't we see, you know, people being manipulated by someone who gets up and says, I'm a prophet and I have special revelation, God said this. Isn't that kind of how we characterize a cult? One of the essential properties? So Paul doesn't want us to get caught up in a cult, being led by a cult leader, does he? That's why he says, test. So I find it very healthy when you have your Bibles open, you're making sure that what I'm saying, what I'm preaching, is not just my own ideas. And I also need to be very clear when the, when the Scripture is clear, but I also need to be clear when, and, and tell you guys, hey, the Scripture's not clear here, but this is what I believe. Or I could say, this is my opinion. 
Because I don't want you, I want, don't want you thinking uncritically over time what Pastor Timothy said. I'd much rather hear you say, Pastor Timothy taught me from the scriptures that, and later on to say, hey, Bible says, and I don't care where you, I don't care if you remember where you learned it from. You know what thrills me? When I hear you, um, you quoting things from scripture, when I hear you things, uh, quoting things uh, uh, from memory that you learned in sermons, and you have no idea where you heard, learned it. But what that tells me, you've already assimilated that truth into your worldview. And that's a beautiful thing. So again, we want to test things. How do you test them? Well, two main ways we're gonna, we'll mention real briefly. One, does it cor- if, if they got a prophecy, the source of that prophecy is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Ultimate source. So is the Holy Spirit ever going to prophesy something through a prophet that contradicts what he's already written in his word? Does the Holy Spirit have a good memory? Does the Holy Spirit remember what he ri- has already written in the Bible? He does. He, he's got it memorized. So he's never going to tell the prophet something that contradicts what he's already written in his word. Ever. Isn't that helpful to know? So one of the ways we test is, does what the prophet's saying, does it correspond with, can it be reconciled with what has already been written in Scripture? That's one way. The second way is, is what the prophet's saying, um, you know, um, Jesus says wisdom is known by all her deeds. Did what the prophet say to do, did it lead to a beneficial outcome? Or if he's, if he's saying something's going to happen, did it happen? Those are two ways. So again, we need to be thinking critically. We don't want to stifle, but we don't also want to be just like um, uh, being led blindly along without knowledge of Scripture. The next one we have here is speaking in unknown languages. What we will do is, again, there are... Uh, theological positions that they have weight on either side. That is to say, some people say they're known languages, and some people say they're unknown languages, what they would call angelic languages. Okay? And both sides make a good case. So I want to talk through that, but I, what I want to conclude is, what, can, what is the text clear on? Okay? Because remember, I said Paul doesn't define these gifts, And he only spends time with gifts that are actually causing problems. That's why he spends a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 talking about the gift of tongues. (laughs) A lot of it, because it's causing problems in Corinth. And so he lays out some very clear, whether you take its known languages or unknown, what we can all agree on is that he sets out some very clear boundaries about the exercise of tongues. And that's what we need to know as a church. If they're going to be used, utilized, now I can tell you what the boundaries are real quick. Can we do that real quick? Basically, it's 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 and 27. And this is towards the end of his argument. So if, no matter what, how you define tongues, if they're going to be exercised in the local church, this is how it has to be done. So he makes a concluding statement in verse 26. Well, my, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. Okay, he's summarizing what he said if you begin in chapter 12. When you meet together, one will uh, uh, sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything done must strengthen one of you. No, he actually says everything done must strengthen all of you. Okay? So that would be a boundary or a guideline. It has to strengthen all of you. He goes on to give a few more boundaries in verse 27. Next verse. No one, I'm sorry, no more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So, one at a time. Um, no more than two and three should speak in tongues, but only of those two and three, only one at a time, and you have to have an interpreter. Okay? Is that pretty clear? Can we all agree on that? That's not very debatable. Paul's pretty clear on that aspect, isn't he? Um, the other thing he, he concludes the, the chapter uh, with 
and the, and the whole uh, talk he's given on gifts is in verse 40. He says this, Be sure that everything is done properly and in order. Or as the King James says, be done decently in order. So if you're going to speak in tongues, it has to build up everybody. It can only be one at a time. It has to be interpreted, and it has to be done orderly. And we'll talk more about that um, in the weeks ahead. But those are the guidelines he gives. I, and, you know, studying this subject, I felt like I could read, write a book. There's just so much information. It's just re- the hardest part of this week was is narrowing it all down to say what would be most helpful to share with you. So we're kind of setting the table. There's many more gifts. Maybe all the gifts I've mentioned thus far seem completely foreign to you. You're like, there's no place for me in the church. I don't relate to any of those gifts. Trust me, there are others. We, def- we break all the gifts down into three main categories. Prophet, priest, and king. And I've given you some prophetic gifts this morning. And maybe your gifts are more inclined along the line of priestly gifts or kingly gifts. That is to say, administrative gifts. So I need you to hang in there. Now, what if you say this? I need to grow first. Or I don't feel ready. Or I'm shy. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We can all feel that way from time to time. All of us. We don't always feel ready. And uh, it's understandable to feel beat down or unready, but guess what? It's not okay to stay that way. Okay? We want to be very gentle and patient. But the thing is, we're not doing our job. I'm not doing my job if over time you don't get equipped to use your gifts. Because if we all stay in the position, hey, I'm just not ready, or I'm too shy, or I'm weak, or I feel beat down, what happens? Years tick by. Years tick by. Now, if, if you're feeling weak, what does that mean? Um, you know, the idea of going to the gym. You know, you ever feel like, hey, I don't feel strong enough, or I'm feeling tired, I don't feel like going to the gym? I hope so. Am I the only one? Do you realize um, you have to have the wisdom to realize, hey, do I need to have time to heal, right? Because you can go into overtraining. Or am I just feeling lazy and I need to go to the gym? Now, will you ever go to the gym and wish you hadn't gone? I often say this. So sometimes you, it's like, Anthony wants to argue on this one. Realizing, and we will later privately, okay? Realizing you are weak doesn't mean you never go to the gym, right? If you say, hey, I'm weak, does that mean I I can never go to the gym because I'm weak? The gym's off limits. It's just not an option for me because I'm so weak. No, it actually, what does it mean? It means you need to go to the gym. It doesn't mean you're not qualified to go to the gym. It means, hey, go to the gym and begin to exercise. So first you need to learn how to exercise. You need to learn. But then you gotta, you got to implement and put into action what you learn. And some of us is like, hey, I don't know where to serve. I don't feel ready. I feel weak. But over time you need to get ready and then try and actually learn through the exercise. So you can read all the workout magazines in the world, but does that change anything? Do you get stronger by reading workout magazines? <laughs> does that change your physique? Do you lose weight reading? No. The idea is, you know, to get nourished, right? So you can go out and build up the body, okay? Don't you wish? That's not how God designed it. So get, the, the idea is we come here and we do get served, right, by hearing sermons, by being worshiping together, but so we can go out and serve. Now, some of you will say, make this excuse. Um, I don't have time. Does that one sound familiar? I don't have time. Oh, money? We'll, we'll come to that one then. I don't have time. Does that sound somewhat familiar? Or am I wasting my time here? I don't have time to use my gifts. And so he's given a, a time to us to invest. And I want to put it this way. If you, if you really take, and I, I really believe I'm being fair here, to say that you don't have time to use your gift in the context of a local church is saying, I don't have time to be a Christian. Do you see how important that is? I mean, it's like, it's not, Christianity is not just about what we don't do, is it? None of us like that expression of Christianity. It's all about the rules. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Okay, I'm not doing all those things, I'm good. Do any of us appreciate that form of Christianity? We call that religion. 
Um, so Christianity is about the exercise, what we talked about before. We all come together, and it's a beautiful thing. Each of us has something to contribute to the assembly. So again, because the exercise of spiritual gifts is so embedded in what it means to be a Christian, what Jesus has called us to do through the local church, to say you don't have time, now you may, there, there may be instances where you don't have time, you actually don't, you have other responsibilities. I'm not trying to say you have to you know, have an apartment at the church where you live here at this building, but if you always are saying I don't have time and years tick by, you're basically saying I don't have time to be a Christian. And further, I have to say this, the church, if we see someone who's not interested year after year after year after year, not interested in using their gifts, it makes it very hard for us to assign to that person the status of Christian. Because we would expect the Holy Spirit would motivate that person to, to the exercise of those spiritual gifts. Do you see? And this whole thing comes down to Jesus saying, hey, I didn't come to be served, but to, but to serve. Do you see how this is so deeply embedded? So we, we want to encourage people, to equip people. Hey, get in on this. This is great. This is where you see the Holy Spirit use you to make a difference in the world. It's not a, you better do this or you're going to be, we're all going to look think bad about you. It's like, hey, no, get in on this. Look what Jesus has done for us. Actually, you're going to come encounter the Holy Spirit. You're going to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit to build people up. Now, not every time there will be discouragement. But that's how we want to look at it. You, you do have time. You're a steward, and it, we have to give it priority that it deserves. Again, we return to the idea of, aren't there going to be some times where people annoy you in the local church? <laughs> no, because we're also spiritual people. Is it okay to hate other people, to speak, to gossip about other people in the church? No. And even outside the church? Is that okay? No. Come on, someone wants to make a good case for it, right? Good men disagree on this, right? Actually, no. <laughs> but we realize, hey, yes, we love each other. Um, understanding spiritual gifts, each other's spiritual gifts, can help us get along. Okay? Because we see life through the lens of our own giftedness. And when you understand that that person who is completely different than you is actually different because God has built them differently or gifted them differently, it helps you see them through that lens in order to have more patience understanding for them. Okay? So, um, understanding each other's gifts allows us to get along better, to be united, and to have each other's backs. It is not okay to gossip and slander about each other. It's not okay to say, I hate being around that person. Oh, I want to, oh, I see that person across the hall, I want to, I want to, I want to get away, I want to move away, right? That's hypocrisy. Okay? And it's, it's ugly. So, People who have different gifts, like we said last week, may react differently to a situation than you. They may have a different emphasis or focus, and this may annoy you at times. Like we talked about the person who spills the Kool-Aid on the carpet. The prophet says How, that you should not spill uh, Kool-Aid on the carpet, right? Because they see things in black and white. That's all they can think about. You shouldn't do that. Like, I know, I know that, right? With the person with the gift of encouragement, is like, oh, let me help you with that. Right? And the kingly or administrative gift says, hey, you know what? Here's how we can plan so that never happens again. Okay? So you might be annoyed by the person that says, hey, you shouldn't spill Kool-Aid in the carpet. But if you understand, hey, they're more prophetic. They kind of see things in black and white. That's just them being them. Doesn't that help you be more compassionate? Right? So you say, hey, you know what? Bless their hearts. Because the person who is too abrupt or too black and white, I promise you, as we said before, there's going to be times when a person that sees things in black and white is just what the situation calls for. The person that is too soft-spoken, you say, that person, they're always, you know, letting themselves be walked all over. They need to stand up for themselves. They need to be more like me. Right? Amen. There will be a time when there is a delicate fragile person who is deeply wounded that needs just that kind of person to minister to them. And the prophet type might just crush that person. Am I right? Aren't you glad God has given us different gifts to work together? Now, I, could, um, I got Diane Scott's permission to pick on her this morning. Okay? Yeah. And I'm picking on you next. Diane Scott does an amazing job as our treasurer, but can't she be very annoying? You don't know Diane Scott the way I know Diane Scott. You know, 
do you, do you realize if you work closely with Diane Scott, she wants, she always wants these little pieces of paper. Receipts. Yeah, receipts. Um, she calls them receipts. And she wants them every month, and she will harass you until you turn them in, or she'll make you fill out a missing receipt form. She will, she will not let it go. She won't. She has this memory, and she'll keep coming at it, right? And then she will threaten to take away her credit card. Okay? She's like, until you can learn to turn the receipts, you don't get a credit card. And it's like, ugh. Why does, she have to, why does she care about these little pieces of paper so much? But then what you realize is Diane allows us to do ministry without fear of bankruptcy. Or the church coming, or us coming to show up for worship one Sunday and there's no lights on. You know what I mean? I would, without Diane Scott and all she does for, I literally would be paralyzed when it comes to ministry. Because I would want to do this, this, and this, and I would, you know, and it's like, it would be a full-time job for me to do what Diane Scott does on the side. Oftentimes it is like a full-time job for her, but I wouldn't know how much money we have for that. Or I wouldn't have thought ahead enough to realize, hey, we're going to need money not only at the beginning of the year, but at the end of the year for this particular ministry. <clears throat> do you realize, I asked Diane Scott, hey, just, um, how are we doing financially? And our, our giving has been, done, been down this year, by the way. It's been down. And... Um, but I, I always go to Diane Scott and say, how are we doing? She would say, well, yeah, the offerings are down, da 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 But then you know what I'll say? Hey, but do we have money for this ministry? She's like, yep, because I've been planning, because I've been saving. Because you turned in all the receipts, we're protected. I know what we have. I keep a detailed record. She allows us, with that gift, that, that administrative gift she has, allows us to do mission effectively. We could say, hey, we're doing the Easter egg hunt by ourselves this year. Do we have a budget for that? She says, yes, specifically, we already have a budget for that, and it's this amount of dollars and this amount of cents. Aren't you glad? So I, if I, in my immaturity, in my backwardness, in my small-mindedness, I could look at Diane Scott and like, yeah, she really gets on my nerves. She's always wanting these pieces of paper. But do you realize her gift, what it does for our church? I, I'm, I'm literally terrified to ever do ministry without Diane Scott. I've said this before. I'll say it again. It would just be like, I would have to hire a CPA. Cliff said you were next. He always wants to give you a hug, doesn't he? I didn't grow up with hugs, except for my mom and my dad, and that was it. Cliff taught me the idea of giving hugs. He taught me this idea. But you know what? He may be, you know, you say, oh, it's too touchy-feely. He always wants to give hugs. Men don't hug, do they? But he's, change, he's changing the culture. Thank you, Josie. Preach it. He's changing the culture, but you realize Cliff is doing that because he's an encourager. When you're with Cliff, he'll encourage you. Don't we need that in the church? Do men need encouragement? Do you know that over time, Cliff has completely changed my mind? I find myself wanting to give hugs. Like when a meeting, you know, if you get to the end of a meeting, you don't know if it's kind of gone well or not. You don't know if the person's, it, 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 you don't know if you're still friends. Cliff taught me, give a hug. That way they know you're still friends. And it works really well. And it's... And I don't give a hug to manipulate the person. Cliff has taught me, I actually want this person to have no, beyond the shadow of a doubt, know that I care about them, that I love them. And Cliff has taught me that if I give them a hug, I can communicate all those things authentic authentically. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Basically, I want us to know, if, you, if there's a person that annoys you, try to look, put yourself in their shoes. See them through the lens of their giftedness. And in maturity, learn uh, realize that God has gifted them in a different way for a different purpose so we can all come together to function as a church. We cannot have a church where we're like getting on each other's nerves and we, we think evil about each other, can we? Is that a place you want to be at? So um, if I tell you the truth, what if God had made everybody just like you? Would that be, a, would that be good? I, I would say about myself, praise God. God didn't make everybody like me. I think I would get on my nerves if I had to encounter me all the time. I don't know how my wife does it, right? So aren't you glad there's diversity? <laughs> all right, hey, can we learn to love each other in a, in a, through appreciating each other's diversity? Can I say one more thing? Can we learn 
to be on the lookout for each other's gifts. And when you see someone do something well, and you see them exercise your gift, give them encouragement. Say, that was awesome. You might be gifted in that. I'm not talking about flattery. I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm talking about genuine encouragement. Someone may be like, hey, I want to use this gift. I hear what you're saying. I want to be a, a legit Christian that uses my gift, but I'm kind of I'm f- fearful. Can we have some encouragers in here to encourage each other? When you see something I may not see off on the periphery or something, give that person some props. Okay? Some people, are the di- only reason they haven't let, used their gifts is because they're not quite sure what they are yet. And we're going to talk more about the discovery of spiritual gifts in the weeks ahead. Does everybody here have a desire, at least a desire, to, to be used by the Lord in the exercise of their gifts? Amen. Can, can we all agree on the necessity of this? We don't want to just pay people to do ministry for us, do we? We want to get on on this. So I need you to get with the Holy Spirit, meditate, and be open. Like, Lord, what would you have me to do? Do you realize he might lead you into a ministry and then a second ministry and a third ministry primarily for the purpose of you discovering that's not your gift? God works in mysterious ways. And I don't want you just getting discouraged on that. You may, you may have a bad experience. But as you can say, hey, you know what? Now I know. I can move on to the next thing. Man, when everybody is using their gifts, this church is going to be powerful. Far more effective. When I hear you guys speak things to me and I realize you're speaking it out of your giftedness, I may want to resist when you tell me, but I'm going home and I'm thinking about that. And I'm making changes accordingly. And I want to be sensitive to God helping to lead me through the exercise of your gifts in my life. And don't we all need that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these people. There's these gracious, uh, generous people. Well, thank you that we get to get on on this. Lord, I pray that, um, Lord, forgive me for being so uh, task-oriented that I failed to have an opportunity to, to minister to someone this week. Lord, I pray that we would all be sensitive to how we can use our gifts this week. Lord, I pray that uh, even at this Easter egg hunt that's coming up in a couple of Saturdays, that we would, uh, some people would have an opportunity to discover what their gifts are. Lord, thank you that you don't let us just watch from the sidelines, but Lord, you're always desiring to include us in on your mission. And Lord, even though you don't need us. So Lord, I pray by your spirit, Lord, that we would not be deceived, but we would cling to your law, to your instructions, and that we would be open to you bringing to our hearts and minds um, the way, the path that you have us to go on, how we should use our gifts. Lord, if there's ways in which we're resisting, Lord, I pray we would repent, and even today, repent, and ask forgiveness and be willing to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.